Well, thank you everyone for the very warm welcome. I know it's the afternoon and the very trail in, so uh, I'll do my best to try to make this an entertaining talk. I can't guarantee it'll be a very high in levity talk because it's a somewhat serious topic, but I'll do my best. Um, so yeah, so as Marietta said, this talk is about setting expectations for open source participation. Now, why am I talking about this? I should probably give some bona fides real quick. Um, so who am I, basically? Uh, from an open source perspective, uh, I'm three things. Um, first is I'm the dev lead for the Python extension for Visual Studio Code. Uh, for those of you who don't know Visual Studio Code, it's Microsoft's cross-platform open source code editor. I know having those three points all in the same sentence kind of freaks some people out. Uh, <laughs> but uh, basically, think of it as Microsoft's um, something similar to Sublime Text or Atom. Uh, please give it a try. It makes my job better. Um, but the reason I'm bringing this up is the Python extension is actually the number one most download, downloaded extension for Visual Studio Code. And it was an open source project from someone named Don J. Mani from Australia. And Microsoft noticed, uh, we hired Don, brought his extension over, made it an official Microsoft open source project, and I'm the dev lead of that. So I'm a dev lead of what I would call uh, corporate open source, which is basically open source that's run as an actual open source project and trying to build a community with outside contributors and such, but has actual paid full-time staffing. Uh, I'm also on the Python language development team with Guido. Uh, I've been on that team now uh, 15 years come April, so more than a third of my life, <laughs> I think. Math is, and my, getting on in age is not so good at, on the stage life. Uh, <laughs> But point is, I've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, I actually got my commit privileges the month after the very first PyCon in 2003, back in DC. Uh, literally, Guido just, I said, I'll do this if someone could commit it. And Guido said, well, don't you have commit privileges? I said, no. I was like, OK, well, someone will give it to you. So, different time compared to what Marietta had to go through to get her commit privileges. Um, and on top of this, I also try to give back to open source whenever I can. Uh, I'm kind of known as nitpicky when it comes to grammar and stuff and, and punctuation and documentation. So certain people in the community like it slash hate it when I go through and start reading their docs, um, which has led to me contributing to over 80 open source projects. <laughs> so I come from a very wide range of positions in terms of open source, in terms of running a project, being heavily involved, both at corporate level and in open source community-driven level, and just contributing overall. So I've ended up with a somewhat, I would think, unique perspective on all this. So that's why I'm here to try to talk about how we can all keep open source running forward in, in a constructive manner. Um, so, but first we need to kind of define what is the purpose of an open source project in community? And I would say it's basically two things. It's maintaining the open source project itself and having fun. Because without both those things, it just isn't gonna work, right? So obviously we're all trying, we're all here because we enjoy Python, whatever, but at least open Python as a project we are trying to keep it running and keep it maintained so that all of you can continue to use it and enjoy it and we can have this fantastic community built around it and just keep it going forward. But if it ain't fun, no one's going to work on it. Uh, <laughs> I know I personally would not be keep, keep working on it if I didn't derive some enjoyment from it. Now, being here brings me enjoyment, getting to see Guido and Marietta and all of you and meeting new people helps make it fun. But if that component wasn't there, what's the point? Uh, the other thing is obviously if we're not maintaining the project and it bit rots, What's the point, right? Because none of us would want to use it, we'll walk away, so it's a balance. We need kind of both of these aspects. And on top of that, you need people to actually make all this happen. Uh, just like Yargo pointed out about community, and we've seen that mul mentioned multiple times, how community is a very important part, at least in Python itself. Now, to have people, you need to attract new people, and you need to maintain and retain the current people. So attracting new people means making sure we're welcoming and we're open and it's easy to get involved. Uh, but you also have to make sure that in doing so, you don't alienate the current people, right? Um, you sometimes hear about businesses where they say like, it's much easier and better to retain customers than to try to attract new ones. And same actually comes with open source and maintainers, for instance. Uh, you can try to move a project forward and try to make it more attractive to new people. But in doing so, if you alienate the current maintainers of the project, you end up with a problem, right? So if you're constantly bringing in new people, that's great, but the ramp up on projects, especially projects as large as Python, can be really steep. Once again, ask Marietta. Um, and so, which is great to get new people, but if it's constantly getting new people and the old people keep falling off, 
then everyone's constantly just ramping up and never getting quite to the high levels for really sticky issues. But then again, if you don't get new people, the old people will slowly drop away, whether they just lose interest, retirement. Uh, we unfortunately have had people pass away in this community. Um, it just happens. And so it's just something you have to really keep an eye on. So with all that in mind, basically what we need to do is work together to set reasonable expectations so that it's enjoyable for everyone, both new people and old people, people who want to contribute, people who want to have fun, and figuring out this great balancing act. Because a really key point that we typically forget is that everyone is either volunteering or being paid by somebody else to work on this open source. So we really need to strive for the symbiotic relationship amongst all ourselves to make sure that uh, everyone involved gets to enjoy the whole process. Now, unfortunately, we don't always succeed at this goal. Um, for those of you who don't know who Corey Benfield is, uh, up until September, I believe, of 2017, um, Corey was uh, employed by HPE to work full-time on open source, and he was the lead maintainer of HyperHD, which is Python's HTTP2 implementation. He's one of the requests maintainer. Uh, he actually gave a great talk at PyCon US 2017 on requests and its code base, I recommend. Uh, he became the interim maintainer of HTTP3, I believe, or was it Eurolib3? Um, basically, the point is, Corey kind of helped run a huge portion of the networking stack for Python. And he sent out this quote on Twitter saying, Here's a bit of real talk for people. I think working in open source has made me a more bitter and short-tempered, end quote. Now, I know Corey. Corey's a very nice guy, but I can totally relate to this, okay? After 15 years of working on Python, I've had this happen to me. I actually had to take a whole month off of open source contributions in October 2016 to prevent burnout. Um, my wife's actually here in the corner, uh, and you can talk to her about it. Um, but <laughs> Open source, as it is right now, can sometimes be really stressful. And the way people deal with stress varies. In Corey's instance, it made him more bitter and short-tempered. And this is a real problem because Corey has a partner. And if she came to him and said, you know what, I don't like what open source is making you become. I don't like you being short-tempered. I don't like you being bitter. You need to choose because I want the nice, happy Corey, not the bitter one. So which one is it? Now, I would hope Corey chooses his partner over open source. <laughs> uh, just like I would expect, I would, if my wife had made me make that exact same choice, I'd choose her. So we have to make sure, basically, we don't put Corey or me in that really tough position of having to choose because open source has driven them into a position of having problems like this. Now, I think this is really driven and ends up in this position because people just don't always act the way they really probably should just, and I think it's not on purpose most of the time, it's just people don't really keep in the front of their head two key things. Um, first is everything in open source has a cost. Which I know sounds a little odd when you think about, oh, open source, it's all this free software that you get for free, and free as in beer, and free as in whatever. But everything has a cost, okay? Whether it's time, effort, emotional output, there is a cost. There is someone behind every single line of that code that you're running that they either put their blood, sweat, and tears into, took some time off on their vacation to do, what have you, but there is a cost to it, and people forget that. People ask for things not realizing that they are asking for something that will have a cost to that person, right? Like, if I do something, I'm basically choosing to spend the time to do that instead of spending it with my wife, Andrea, right? Or going out with my friends. Now, I can try to time it so that, well, Andrea's off doing something with her friends that I don't want to do, I can spend my time at home, but there is a balance here that can be really hard to strike because I am making a judgment call of choosing to spend my free time doing that instead of something else that might be honestly more mentally uh, better for me because it's more balanced. Once again, ask the wife about balance of open source or not. <laughs> um, but the key point is just to remember that everything has a cost. People are not doing this out of just a snap of their finger and it's done. There is time and so forth. The second thing is, people forget that open source is really just a series of favors, right? Like, especially in community-based open source projects, everyone is taking, once again, their emotional output, their free time, their effort to do this, but oftentimes when someone outside comes in and asks them to do something on their behalf, you're basically asking them a favor to do for you, right? Um, it's, I have a quote you're gonna see later that people 
really seem to like, apparently, uh, but it's like giving you a gift that you never really asked for. Uh, it's like giving, giving, being given that pull request that you never actually wanted necessarily, and then having to be the guy that says, okay, you're asking me to do you a favor to get this in because you want that feature, but there's certain costs to that that you might not realize, and it can really get people upset when you say no. And we'll cover some examples in a couple slides about that. But people just seem to forget that we're really interacting in terms of favors. And there's a certain way we all interact when it comes to favors, right? You, you're always asking, right? It's like, could you please consider this? Could you look at this? Instead of, you really should do this, right? There's a really difference in tone that people forget. And once again, I don't think most people do this on purpose, but it's something people don't put in the front of their head when they're doing this, right? Realizing that, A, you're asking someone to do something for you that has a cost, and B, that it's really a favor. So it really comes down to just having that concept when you're working with people to make sure that everyone just works on an equal playing field and fully understands what's going on here. So we're going to go through a couple typical uh, scenarios in open source. Uh, I'm going to use Stuart. Uh, those of you who might know Stuart Williams from Winnipeg, uh, if you're from PyCon Canada, or PyCon US will know who that steward is, because uh, he gave me the idea of the phrasing on these slides, and then, well, that's me. Um, I'm gonna talk about some typical scenarios and kind of who's doing favors for who, and how things can go wrong, with, and some real life examples, more or less, uh, with names hidden to not offend anyone. Uh, so using open source, right? So in a way, when you use open source, as a maintainer, I'm kind of doing you a favor by saying like, okay, here, here's some open source, you can feel free to use it. I'm not trying to force you to use it, but it's there if you want to use it. Now, worst case, you can kind of take this as a worst case example of uh, someone leaving out a pamphlet denying climate change, right? I might be pushing some open source that you don't particularly care for. That's fine. You don't have to use it. You can say it's, you can just choose to not use it because you don't think it's very good, whatever. You can choose to just leave it and not pick up that pamphlet, more or less. Make sense? But basically, the key thing is, is you don't have to necessarily uh, be rude about not taking it, it's fine. You just don't have to take it. Now the problem is, um, people also like to provide feedback. Now, if you do it in a constructive way, right, and you provide me feedback on some open source I've done, that's fantastic and that's great and people should definitely do that. It just needs to be done in a constructive fashion because remember, there's cost to everything and there is time involved and everyone's asking people to do favors and stuff and it just needs to be done in a proper way. Because if you don't, you quickly end up in these situations where you don't think about what you're saying to people. Like saying to someone, you're stupid. Purely because you don't agree with the technological decision that someone did in their open source. Right? I've heard plenty of people call Python stupid. You've got to realize that I've put 15 years of my life into this project that you just called stupid. Right? It's stuff people just never really think about. There are people behind that project, right? Guido's put 26 years of his life. I mean, I can't even compare that. Um, but there, the point is, is when you put that much time and effort into a project and you just say it's stupid, or even a feature, right? Like someone put a lot of time and effort into that feature, right? Like you might, I'm sure there's some people in here who find import really frustrating, but you know, I sank years of my life implementing that again in Python, right? So when someone says, oh yeah, import's stupid, God. Ugh. You're, basically, you're basically saying, what I did was stupid. And I do read the internet, by the way. <laughs> right? So people think, oh, like I had this happen, right? On Hacker News, someone posted a thing that got to the front page of Hacker News that was just a little tirade against Python. It's like, I like Python, it's good, but this was stupid. Why the hell did they do this? Blah, blah, blah. Just a real negative, negative, negative. And I responded on Hacker News saying, like, you gotta realize, I just read this. And you know what? I helped make this project go for 15 years of my life so far. I put a lot of time and effort into this, and you basically just said, I'm stupid, a friend of mine is stupid, another friend of mine is stupid, 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 stupid. You just basically just insulted us. You could have just said like, I like Python, I don't quite understand why this was done this way, and that's okay. Like, had you even come to us and asked like, why was it structured this way? We could have just explained it to you. Because you know, after 26 years, there are certain reasons why things are done that might not make sense today, but did then, and now it's just part of the language. So as Guido said, everyone uses every nook and cranny of Python at this point. So it's just one of these things where people just don't stop and think about there are people at the under, other end of these projects. Um, so we need a contribution. 
Uh, it can be kind of like someone giving you a puppy you never wanted. Uh, it's a funny little quip, but the key thing you got to think about here, right, is if someone gives you a puppy, that's quite an amount of dedication you're giving into, right? I mean, a puppy's going to last well over a decade, right? Your, your, dog, your puppy's going to turn into a dog, and that dog's going to live a while. You're going to have vet bills. You've got to take it out. You've got to feed it. There's responsibility there. Now, the same thing comes with contributions, and it's, people just don't think about that. When you submit a pull request to Python, right, I look at it, and I have to make a decision, do I want to support that code for another 15 years of my life? Right? It's a real weird thing to think about. But remember, Python's been around for 26 years. Right? We've outlasted version control systems. I have personally moved Python from subversion to material to Git. And before that, poor Martin von Lois moved us from CVS to subversion. <laughs> right? I mean, we outlast stuff. Uh, Python predates Unicode, right? Python came out publicly February 1991, I believe, right? Yep. Uh, Unicode came out as a standard in October of 1991, right? It, it's just, it just blows your mind when you start to think about this time scale here, which is why I always think it's amazing Guido stuck around and kept it going and has made this great community, and we keep wanting to go forward with it. But you've got to realize, when you submit a contribution, I had to think on terms of that time scale. And then on top of that time scale, I've got to think about whether I want to make all of you have to use that code. Right? When I commit something, I'm making you and about 7 million other developers have to use that in the next release. And then on top of that, I've got to think about all the billions of other people in the world who are going to be using your code indirectly. So like when I commit that, do I have to worry about breaking Instagram and making the whole world unhappy because they can't see their favorite cat photo that day? <laughs> I mean, it's that kind of time scale. So this is really tough when someone's trying to do me a favor by giving me this code, but then I have to make this really difficult decision of how do, do I accept it or not? Because I might literally have to ask book authors to rewrite books because I accepted your change. I mean, it's really weird when you start to think about this kind of stuff. But because of this, people need to be really understanding when I say no. Because I can, there's the nice way of saying, I really appreciate you put in that time and effort, but I have to say no for these reasons. But I mean, some people will, some project maintainers will just say, you're doing it wrong. And that's not right. Like, remember, this is all about favors. When you did me the favor of sending me this pull request, I should at least reciprocate that favor by being nice to you and saying, thank you, but no thank you, and it give a reason. Um, sometimes people don't take well to that. Uh, it's almost like the, why don't you love me response. <laughs> it's like, why? Why don't you want this? It's a one line change. It's like, well, yeah, one line in a piece of software that's used by millions of people directly and billions indirectly that will outlast my career, probably. Um, yeah, or you think it's really critical, but not everyone else will. And I understand why you find it so important, but that does not mean it translates to everyone else on the planet. So the interaction can get really bad really quick if people won't stop and think about, once again, cost everything, so you have to be nice about it. Like, I have to admit that your PR has a cost that you put into making it, but then you also have to realize there's a cost to me for accepting it, but also then being, realizing everyone's doing a favor. You did the favor by sending it to me, and then I'm doing a favor to you either accepting it, or I have to reciprocate the favor by just saying no politely and explaining why. And then maintaining, even amongst maintainers can be difficult. Uh, 15 years means I'm fairly passionate about this project in the community, and I will fully admit, I have gotten into online virtual shouting matches in the past with certain core maintainers over ideas. Now, I've <laughs> done the best I can over the years to not lose my head. But I honestly once got into an argument once with a core maintainer that I almost broke down crying over, right? It gets really heated on occasion. Because these are also friends of mine, right? Once again, 15 years, right? The Guido is my homie t-shirt is a little weird because Guido is a friend of mine. So it's one of these things where stuff really does happen and it can get really heated even amongst maintainers. I, I compare it to arguing with your siblings about politics. Really, in the end, it is just software people. It's not that critical. But we still get so heated about it that it's just like, ah, it's like, take a deep breath, it's okay. Something my wife's trying to teach me. <laughs> but my key point in all these is everything has a cost and everyone's trying to do favors and we need to just keep that in mind when we do this stuff. Um, and I do realize this might sound kind of biased towards maintainers, but that's because it is. 
there are a lot more people trying to submit pull requests to Python than there are core maintainers to review them. So there is a scale factor here as well. So when you submit something to a project, keep in mind, it's quite possible there's only one person maintaining that poor thing, right? Versus the, who knows, thousands of people depending on it. So something to keep in mind here is there is a complete skew and disconnect in terms of scale. Uh, so do be forgiving if you submit a pull request that takes a while for someone to get to on a project. It's quite possible just one guy on his weekends who's just being nice enough to give his time and energy and take it away from his family and friends to keep this project running. So just be patient, please. Um, though as I said, the really key point I wanna harp on here is keep in mind that everyone needs to act like everyone's doing each other a favor, which basically means um, it's okay to say no graciously, uh, but you shouldn't place demands on someone who's doing you a favor, otherwise you're simply being unreasonable. Or at least that's how I view favors, right? Like if I ask you to do me a favor, it's okay if you say no, that's why it's a favor, it's not a demand, we're not paying you for it or something. There's no exchange here. I'm just asking you to do something nice for me. And hopefully you'll say yes, and if you say no, it's okay. But you need to do it nicely because there might be a favor request the other way around. And really this is what this all boils down to in this talk, is we don't all do this and we really need to work on it because this is what leads to people becoming bitter. Right? The reason I had to take that month off back in October of 2016 was because I had a series of three months where every other week I had one bad interaction. And psychologists say it takes about 10 positive interactions to undo one negative. And I'm afraid to say, we don't all thank open source contributors for taking the time and energy to do this often enough to counter out those negatives. Right? Like I tweet this on occasion and I do get the thanks, but I have to actively almost beg for, for thank yous to counteract that negative. And it's, it feels kind of icky to ever do that, but sometimes I do need that uplifting bit because the negatives really do pound you down really fast. Um. <laughs> Thank you very much, I do appreciate that. Uh, I'd also thank Marietta and Guido and everyone else who's ever submitted a PR and all of you for being here and making this community awesome. This is why I keep coming back 15 years later and can you do so and continue to hope my wife will let me continue to do so. Uh, so thank her too. Um, but I'm also running out of time, so I, I gotta wrap this up. Uh, so basically how should we act towards people, right? We should be open, right? We should be open to the favors people wanna give us and do for us. Uh, we should be considerate when receiving those favors, right? Uh, be nice, but we should also be respectful of what we're asking of people, right? So like if you send a PR in, be open to the fact that it might get rejected, be nice about when you're asking it because you are asking a favor and be respectful if they say no. And same for maintainer, right? Be open to people saying you f constructive, nice feedback, be considerate in how you respond to that feedback or the PR and be respectful about the fact that you are asking people who may have sent you a PR to say no, I realize you put time and effort in your life and said no in the end. Coincidentally, that is exactly what the PSF code of conduct is. Right? There is a reason why the PSF chose openness, consideration, and respectfulness for the code of conduct. Uh, and if I had to give people guidelines, uh, my wife is in HR, so I sometimes think in these terms, uh, how to communicate online, there's basically three things. Uh, basically, assume you're asking me a favor, because you basically probably are, and I have a really good memory, so I won't forget. Uh, so if you ask me, if, ask me a favor, and you kind of are rude about it. I will remember who you are, who you worked for, and I probably won't forget. Uh, so keep that in mind. It's not a threat, just a point. Um, two, write as if your boss is gonna read what you say, um, because hopefully you care about your job. Uh, and if you don't like your boss, then assume your family's gonna read what you're gonna say. Uh, hopefully you care about them if you don't care about your boss, or vice versa. Uh, but the key, hopefully, my key point is hopefully one of these three things will cause you to stop and think about what you're about to say, because uh, somewhat as a line from the movie The Social Network, their net's written in ink, and people will see it, people will remember it, people will read it and feel it, because once again, there are people at the other end of those tweets and those emails and those GitHub pull requests and what have you. Um, but really, in the, all in the end, what I think we really all just need to remember is we need to pay for open source with kindness. Because once again, we don't want to make anyone regret coming to open source just because people are being cranky and rude and 
and just not nice. Because remember, we're all doing this together as a huge set of favors, and it would be awesome if we keep doing this. So if we could just pay for open source with, with kindness, that would just be awesome. Thank you.